Hi everyone, it's Katrina, the Kina Metzin. Long before the Spanish arrived in Mexico, even before the mighty citizens of Teotihuacan fled their city of gods, there were giants. In Mesoamerican mythology, a race of giants known as the Kinametzin lived in Mexico. We don't know exactly how tall they were, but they were bigger than average-sized humans. Friar Andres de Olmos wrote in his chronicles that the bones of a human foot were uncovered in New Spain in the 16th century. Each toe on the appendage was about the same size as a human hand. Unfortunately, though, de Olmos might not be the most reliable source. He wrote a lot about giants between 1528 and 1571, so it's hard to say if he was obsessed or if he was just writing down the facts. The Codex Sumarraga is an ancient text that explains that for the indigenous people of Mexico, giants were creations of the gods. But they perished like the citizens of Atlantis during a great flood that swept through the mountains of Tlaxcala. Either that, or they were vanquished by a group of merchants who moved inland from the coast and stole their land. There are a few different myths and legends, but they all say that the giants existed and were killed. The best estimates we have place the death of the giants, the Kinametzin, at 200 BC. Keep in mind, there is no physical proof of this, which is why it's something scientists can't explain. We have eyewitness testimonies and legends, but there are no preserved human fossils or archaeological remains. It's possible the ancients were trying to understand the megalithic structures found scattered across Mexico. So they dreamt up stories of giants to make sense of what they saw in the world around them. It's also possible that giants or a bigger race of humans did exist, and maybe they ate people, which would explain why they were wiped out. It's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Mega Pint Molly for the super thanks and for supporting this channel. Thanks, Molly! If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. The Temple of Olympian Zeus The Temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens isn't so impressive when you look at it today. A couple of the columns are still standing, and you can see some broken into pieces on the ground. Zeus isn't anywhere to be seen. But if you have a good imagination, 2,600 years ago, this place was amazing. It was the largest temple in ancient Greece, and people came from far and wide to see it and bask in its glory. It was built to be a wonder of the ancient world. Pisistratus was a politician in ancient Athens who ruled as a tyrant. To appease the people, he ordered the construction of large, impressive monuments, and to show off. Construction began on the vast temple in the 6th century BC, around 550 BC. However, it wouldn't be completed for another 650 years. It's believed Roman Emperor Hadrian was responsible for adding the finishing touches to the temple in 132 AD, so he gets a lot of the credit. The first stones were laid over the ruins of an outdoor sanctuary built by Pesistratus. After his death, the temple was demolished and his sons began construction on a new temple. This one would be colossal, a great temple worthy of the king of the gods himself, Zeus. But the construction ran into a series of roadblocks when the pair behind it was expelled from Athens in 510 BC. There were assassination attempts, love triangles, and all sorts of things going on, so finishing the temple was not a priority. The temple remained untouched for years, with Greeks believing it was impossible to build such a monolithic construct. Aristotle even wrote about the temple, calling it an example of Athenian tyrants trying to keep the population busy with construction instead of rebelling. Then came King Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was so deluded he thought himself to be the human personification of Zeus. So of course, the temple to himself had to be amazing. He started the project again in 174 BC, commissioning great chunks of marble to be fashioned in the Corinthian style. He died, however, in 164 BC with the temple half-finished. Emperor Hadrian then finally finished it off in the 2nd century AD. It remained a place of worship until around the 6th century. By then, Zeus had fallen, and Christ had risen as the primary lord and savior, and the temple was dismantled and used in various building projects. Although it's not technically standing today, we know most of the history of the temple. The one thing scientists can't necessarily figure out is its construction. 
There were 104 columns holding up the structure that was 300 feet long. Each one weighed a whopping 364 tons. There was supposedly the statue of Zeus himself, but not a single piece of evidence exists to suggest it once stood at the Olympion. Nobody knows what happened to it or how truly massive it was. According to historical accounts, though, it was big and was crafted in the same style as the statue of Athena at the Parthenon. There was also a massive statue of Hadrian, maybe even a few Hadrian statues, which are also missing. Octopus Aliens A new scientific theory is suggesting octopuses are aliens that came to Earth in cryogenically preserved eggs. According to some, squid and octopus eggs may have arrived on our planet millions of years ago in icy pods. Since the octopus and its cephalopod relatives are so strange, maybe this explains it? The thing about the octopus is that scientists have never been able to explain how it suddenly emerged on our planet 270 million years ago. It has no history that we know about previous to that time, and it doesn't appear to have evolved from anything that we've been able to find. They are soft and squishy, and it's very hard to find ancient relatives, if there are any. So where did it come from? It simply showed up and has been living in our oceans ever since. Scientists from the University of Chicago and the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan joined forces to study their DNA. They found that octopuses have 33,000 genes, roughly 10,000 more than a human. The octopus is without a doubt the most alien creature we have on the planet. They are scary smart, can solve puzzles, use tools, and are amazing escape artists. Its nervous system, brain, eyes, and borderline paranormal abilities put it far ahead of humans on the evolutionary scale. They just never bothered to build cities or try to take over the planet like we did. Their arms and suckers can basically think on their own, and they even dream when they're sleeping. Because the majority of their neurons exist in their arms and suckers and not in their brain, that makes them as close to alien intelligence as scientists can find on Earth. This radical theory of the octopus coming from space was proposed by 33 scientists participating in a new study. They suggested that octopuses arrived on Earth through panspermia. This means their eggs hitchhiked a ride on comets and asteroids that exploded in our atmosphere or landed in the oceans. This was a very big study, and it was published in the prestigious journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology. Scientists suggested octopuses weren't the only things that arrived on Earth from somewhere else in the universe. The entire Cambrian explosion may have originated in the stars. Comets and asteroids bombarded the Earth, carrying with them organic molecules from other worlds. These molecules may have been the first life forms on the planet. Then, unrelated to the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago, octopuses showed up on their own comets. It would make sense because they seem to be far ahead on the evolutionary path from a world that isn't ours. They have no obvious ancestors, their physiology doesn't match any other living creature, and in all honesty, they are total anomalies on this planet. So maybe they did arrive on Earth by hitching a ride on an asteroid. But at the moment, nobody can say for sure. What do you think about this theory? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. Baldur's Rock Baldur's Rock is a mysterious stone that dates back to the beginning of the Viking Age in the 9th century AD, but it could have been created much earlier, maybe even in the 8th century. Nobody knows the purpose of the stone, but have suggested it may have been a memorial megalith at the head of a grave, or maybe a burial site for a powerful family. The standing stone is positively enormous, towering 24 feet above the ground. It's the tallest stone of its kind in Norway, yet it's largely unknown to most people. The stone is standing behind some trailers in the middle of the countryside, out of view of tourists and untouched by modern archaeologists. The stone gets its name from the Norse god Baldr, who was Odin's son and the brother of Thor. In Viking tradition, Frithiof the Bold was a fearless warrior who had many adventures. He fought bravely as a Viking and burned down Baldur's temple. He also became the king of Ringarigen, Norway. The only evidence we have that Frithiof was a real person comes from Icelandic sagas that were written in 1300 AD. Like so many ancient Viking characters, 
there is almost no physical evidence Frithjof existed or that his adventures really happened. However, Baldur's Rock may have been the memorial stone placed on his grave. But that's just according to the local legend. So, unfortunately, without further evidence, we can't say for sure whose grave is marked by the stone. The Mechanics of the Great Pyramid It's been 4,500 years since the Great Pyramid of Giza was completed, and still scientists can't say with 100% certainty how it was made. For years, scientists have tried to use archaeological evidence to work out the logistics of this mega-project. We know, based on historical text, it had nothing to do with slave labor. Recently, scientists have estimated it took as few as 2,000 organized workers to complete the project in about two decades. But how could this have been possible? The Great Pyramid is 481 feet tall, built under the reign of Pharaoh Khufu sometime around 2560 BC. And every stone that was used in the construction was mined from a quarry just south of the pyramid. But how did a handful of workers get the stones they needed all the way across the desert to build the tallest monument in the world on loose sand? Some experts have theorized that the Egyptians used canals, waterways that allowed them to transport the blocks on boats directly to the base of the pyramid. Other researchers think the Egyptians got the sand wet first, making a slip and slide across the desert. But then there is the matter of how they got these stones 481 feet in the air without using a crane. Even today, lifting a two and a half ton stone to the peak of the Great Pyramid without a crane would prove extremely difficult. So how in the world were the ancient Egyptians able to accomplish this feat? The answer could lie in something very simple. Yanis Gordon was among the university team investigating Hatnub, a rock quarry in the eastern desert. Yanis said he and his team uncovered a unique ramp flanked by two pairs of stairs fitted with special holes for wooden posts. The ramp is incredibly steep, but could have been used to lift extremely heavy rocks to exceptional heights using ropes and wooden posts. Workers on the stairs flanking the ramp used a pulley system to yank the stone up a little bit, then they used wooden pegs to secure it in place. This method could have theoretically allowed the Egyptians to lift the heavy stones used in the construction of the pyramid to exceptional heights without the use of a ramp. It would have been hard work, but not impossible. But this is still just a theory. The exact construction method of the ancient Egyptians is still an unsolved mystery, one that we'll hopefully be able to figure out in the future. If they could do it, we should be able to understand how. The Sego Canyon Rock Art Thousands of years before today, indigenous people living in Utah painted some extremely strange pieces of artwork on rock walls in Sago Canyon. This rock art is located just west of Colorado, off US Route 70. In the beginning of the 20th century, a small coal mining town sprang up here. When the operation failed, the town went bankrupt and was eventually deserted. Something very similar likely happened thousands of years ago. The indigenous people painted ghostly images on the canyon walls, then vanished into thin air. Archaeologists think there were three different tribal groups who lived in the canyon and added to the rock art. There were the Utes, the Fremont, and the Archaic peoples. The Ute tribe were the ones who gave Utah its name. They painted horses and other animals sometime after 1493. Considering that Christopher Columbus was the one who brought horses to the Americas, that's the only timeline that makes sense. North America did have horses, but they went extinct 10 to 12,000 years ago. Then there were the Archaic people who lived here as early as 8,000 BC. However, their rock paintings have been very difficult to trace. But the artwork created by the Archaic people are also the strangest. They left behind images of weird-looking figures reminiscent of alien beings. On the walls of Sago Canyon are creatures with huge, empty eye sockets, circular heads, and misshapen bodies. Some of these figures even wear what appear to be helmets as if they had spacesuits on. These strange beings are joined by odd floating objects emitting some kind of energy from their bottoms. And in all honesty, they look like UFOs blasting into the sky. Archaeologists have dismissed any notion that these drawings were made to represent alien visitors. 
The experts say the figures were representations of gods. And according to them, the things that look like UFOs are likely rain clouds with streaks of rain falling from them. But this is all just guesswork, so we don't really know who these figures were. They could have been gods, aliens, or an entirely unknown race of human beings. What do you think is depicted in the rock art? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and while you're at it, be sure to subscribe! The Green Rock There is a giant green rock in the ancient capital of the Hittite Empire, which is located in modern Turkey. The green rock is beautiful and oddly enchanting, but it's also extremely strange. Locals call it the Wishing Stone, and they say prayers and ask for things while holding both their hands to the bizarre rock. Archaeologists are currently struggling to figure out what the stone was used for and how it made it to this ancient site in the first place. Professor Andreas Schachner says the rock could be made from serpentine or nephrite. He also believes it was used as an object of great importance by every civilization that lived in the area following the annihilation of the Hittites in 1280 BC. That was when they signed a treaty with the Egyptians and began to fade away into the history books. Fun fact, the Treaty of Kadesh between Egypt and the Hittites is believed to be the first written peace treaty ever signed. But we still don't know much about these people. What we do know, however, is that they had immense military power during the Bronze Age. They fought for two decades against the Egyptian pharaohs but could never reach a sure victory. We also know the Hittites had their own unique religion, and they built temples in all their great cities, especially their capital of Hattusa where the green rock still stands today. The green rock looks extremely out of place amidst the sandy ruins of the city. It's still bright green, looking almost like polished jade. It was likely mined from somewhere nearby. The fact that it's here isn't that crazy, but it's a mystery as to why it hasn't been destroyed or stolen throughout the years. It's like every other piece of the civilization was left to ruin, but nobody dared touch the shimmering green stone not in over 3,000 years. This begs the question, does it have some type of supernatural power? And was it believed to hold the soul of an ancient god like a genie in a bottle? Unfortunately, we just don't have the answers. I am the Tuscan Sky. On October 27, 1954, something happened in Tuscany that scientists have never been able to explain. Fiorentina was playing against Pistoiese in a football game with 10,000 people in attendance when something unbelievable caused every single spectator to turn their eyes to the sky. The players stopped playing, the commentators stopped commenting, and the spectators stopped spectating. Everyone fell silent, and they all turned their eyes to the Tuscan sky. An unidentified flying object was right there above them. It was shaped somewhat like a disc, performing impossible acrobatics through the clouds. So, it didn't seem to be an aircraft. This took place in the 1950s, meaning there was nothing any government had created, not even in secret, that could perform such miraculous movements. It wasn't a short sighting either. The extraterrestrial spectacle went on for a full 15 minutes. Many people in attendance that day described the UFO as egg-shaped. Everyone watched as it zipped around, then disappeared as quickly as it had arrived. But just as it vanished, it released silver flakes of some bizarre substance like long strings of glitter. The glitter covered everything, getting stuck in the trees and falling on the playing field. It's been almost 70 years and nobody has ever come up with an explanation for what happened. It's been so long that most scientists these days attribute it to mass hysteria. Some have suggested it was spider silk that fell from the sky during some weird spider migration but that's almost more outlandish than aliens. They didn't have the kinds of scientific technology we do today, so that residue was never tested. And since they didn't have cell phones, it wasn't recorded and posted online for everyone to see. This event was very real, though, and was witnessed by 10,000 people. The Klerksdorp Spheres The Klerksdorp Spheres are what we call out-of-place objects, and these tiny orbs are an estimated 3 billion years old. Every scientific analysis has proven that these spheres are pyrophyllite deposits that were formed billions of years ago by natural means. They were found in Autostal, South Africa, and appeared in newspaper articles in the 1980s. 
The reason the spheres caught so much attention was because they look like cricket balls. Each spherical orb, an ordinary mineral deposit, has perfectly symmetrical rings around its middle. These lines look as though they were carved on purpose, made with such precision that they could have been produced by a machine. But who in the world was manufacturing tiny cricket balls three billion years ago? The answer is likely nobody. Ever since they were discovered, the Klerksdorp spheres have been the source of endless controversy. In the 1980s, people believed they came from a higher civilization that lived before the biblical flood. One museum curator claimed they vibrated on their own. Other alleged scientists have called them proof of alien life on this planet, way before the world even had oceans. Geologist Bruce Cairncross described them as mystery spheres in 2006. And when a psychic examined the stones, they declared the artifacts to be remnants from a spaceship. None of the wackier theories have ever been proven, though. The only thing scientists have said for sure is that these spheres are mineral concretions. They became spheres naturally over many years in the Earth. As for the mysterious rings that make them such a hot topic, they were likely imprints from the host stone. The rock likely left a layer effect, which we see in the lines. It's all geological, not so much supernatural. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Tank Tracks A Russian academic and geologist by the name Dr. Alexander Koltypin believes he's discovered proof that an ancient civilization lived on Earth 14 million years ago. Alexander says the civilization was highly advanced and had in their possession all-terrain vehicles. As evidence, Alexander cites a series of mysterious tracks tracks that look like they were left by some weekend dirt bikers in Turkey's Phrygian Valley. The tracks are very real. We have photographs of them and we know they are there. However, there is no scientific evidence for what made them. The ruts are extremely deep and look as though they were petrified shortly after they were made. But now they are nothing but grooves in the solid rock. Think of a dinosaur footprints only with prehistoric wheels. When a dinosaur stepped in some mud, that mud would harden, and millions of years later, its tracks would still be there. This is the same kind of thing. But Dr. Koltypin says the tracks were made by intelligent beings. They may not have been human, but must have been smart enough to build vehicles with wheels. Archaeologists have known about the tracks for a long time. They are in the middle of the ancient lands of the Phrygians, who rose as a powerful civilization in the 8th century BC. Some experts have theorized the markings in the rock could be the petrified remains of wagon wheel tracks from the days of the Phrygians. But others have suggested they were made by alien vehicles. Dr. Koltypin is convinced the tracks are 14 million years old. And he is, after all, a geologist. But other than him, there aren't any respected scientists willing to confirm the dating. What do you think? Ancient chariots or alien bikers? Let me know in the comments below. Pyramid Alignment Just about everything about the Great Pyramids of Giza is mysterious, from the construction techniques to the purpose of the ancient monuments. Strange hidden chambers have been discovered in recent years and bizarre voids that scientists can't explain. But there is one thing they are desperate to solve, and that's the secret of the pyramid's perfect alignment. Scientists have never been able to figure out how the three structures became so perfectly aligned with one another and with the universe itself. For example, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the biggest of them all, has square sides measuring 455 feet. Each side is straight as a ruler and aligned perfectly with the four cardinal points of the compass. Archaeologist and engineer Glenn Dash says the architects of the pyramid designed it to be within 1 15th of one degree accurate. The pyramid points north, south, east, and west with perfect precision. But how did the ancient Egyptians achieve such an amazing feat of engineering 4,500 years ago? They didn't have drones or computers, and they had no way to accurately pinpoint the proper alignment. However, they did have the stars. 
Most experts believe the Egyptians used the equinoxes and solstices and the movements of the sun and stars to align their pyramids. Either that or they somehow had access to unknown knowledge and technology, the mermaid. The skeleton of an ancient mermaid was unearthed in Bulgaria. At least, that's what the story claims. According to news outlets, an ancient skeleton of a mermaid was found near Sozopol Beach by a man named Professor Dimitrov. The skeleton was dated to the days before the Great Flood, which supposedly washed away most life on the planet 8,000 years ago. However, most mainstream archaeologists believed this story to be fake. They discovered that the alleged mermaid skeleton was nothing more than a human skeleton from an archaeological dig in Ireland that was photoshopped to have a fish's tail. And that brings us to our next story, the mysterious mummified mermaid with a human face, which is said to be 300 years old. This creature is very real, at least in the sense that it physically exists. The mermaid was allegedly caught off the coast of Japan sometime between 1736 and 1741. It's currently kept in the sacred Anjuin temple in the Japanese city of Asakuchi. The specimen has the frowning face of a human, pointy teeth, two hands, and a fish-like lower half. Scientists from the Kurashiki University of Science and Arts say the creature has been worshipped at the temple for decades. People even prayed to it during the coronavirus panini in hopes that it would fix the situation. It's not likely that the creature is a mermaid, but it's possible that it was stitched together using a bunch of mismatched animal parts to make it look like one. The question remains, could mermaids have really existed? Scientists don't know for sure, but the possibilities are endless. Big shout out to Berenice for the super thanks! This is so helpful for us to keep making more videos and creating more fun things for everybody, so big thank you to Bernice! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join us for more videos about mysterious discoveries and strange history. Aliens at the Baptism of Jesus There is an ancient painting that some believe proves aliens were present at the Baptism of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. The painting is called The Baptism of Christ, and it was made by Ertegelder in 1710. Amazingly, his masterpiece is still causing hysteria among alien hunters and conspiracy theorist groups to this day. The painting shows John the Baptist as he baptizes Christ at the River of Jordan. There is a large crowd watching the baptism, and in the sky hovers what seems to be a UFO. Sitting above Jesus and John the Baptist is an object that looks undoubtedly like a spaceship. To make it even more convincing, the ship is beaming down rays of light directly on John and Jesus. Skeptics say the artist was merely trying to capture Matthew 3.16 which says Jesus saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove when he was baptized. But alien hunters insist the object in the sky isn't God, but instead a metallic sphere. The artist may have been trying to insinuate that Jesus Christ has some kind of connection to extraterrestrial visitors. It could all be a coincidence, but it seems really strange that a UFO from the 1700s looks exactly like UFOs described by eyewitnesses in the 21st century. The Rishad Structure The Rishad Structure can be found hidden in the Sahara Desert, surrounded by these shifting sand dunes. It's known as the Eye of the Sahara and has been a source of mystery ever since the 1960s when it was discovered. Some have claimed the structure represents the ruins of Atlantis, while others say it's a scar left behind by a prehistoric comet. The structure was first seen by astronauts with the Gemini mission. They photographed the geological marvel and named it the Eye of Africa. It's one of the most mesmerizing features that can be seen by humans orbiting the planet. It's 650 feet tall, 25 miles wide, and it's made entirely of rock. Geologists have classified it as a domed anticline, meaning it was made from smaller rocks fused together into the unmistakable shape of an eye. Its composition isn't up for debate. We know the structure is made from a variety of different kinds of rock, but its origins are still unknown. Some say that Greek philosopher Plato was talking about a great city that once covered the Rishat structure when he described Atlantis around 360 BC. There's no physical proof, but the theory exists all the same. More rational scientists have been busy trying to figure out how it was formed naturally. They think it's 100 million years old and was made by volcanic activity. They believe the eye was once a huge cavern of magma, which ballooned up and dissolved the limestone surrounding it. 
This eventually caused it to collapse, leaving behind the eye. China's Fairy Realm Newly discovered artifacts from ancient China are pointing at a bizarre belief in a long-lost realm of fairies. At the archaeological site of San Jingdui in Sichuan province, experts have uncovered strange bronze sculptures depicting animalistic beasts. They've also discovered other treasures made from bronze, jade, and gold. All of these artifacts were found inside a series of burial pits in the lost city and appear to have been put there as offerings. But scientists have no idea what the offerings could have been for. They also don't know who the residents of the city of San Xingdui were or what they believed in. Inhabitants of the city vanished 3,000 years ago, and it's not entirely clear where they went. These people are one of the biggest historical mysteries archaeologists are currently investigating. They built their mighty city about 4,500 years ago and lived within its borders for 1,500 years before disappearing. That's a long time. Two offering pits were discovered in the 1980s, and six more have been excavated since 2020. Over 13,000 artifacts have been discovered, and according to Jay Shu from the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, most of them were buried as offerings to beings from another realm. Jay believes that just like other early human societies, the people here believed they could commune with a world beyond the physical one. It was a kind of fairy dimension, a shadow realm that the people of San Xingdui hoped could help them out of a crisis. They buried all their greatest treasures, hoping the residents of the mysterious realm would come to their rescue. But we don't know what the trouble was. Teotihuacan's Ancient Power Plant Nobody knows who built the pre-Aztec city of Teotihuacan. It was already ancient when the Aztec found it, and they were so amazed by the abandoned ruins of the great city that they thought it was created by a race of ancient giants. Whoever came before them had built a great city of the gods. Teotihuacan was home to an estimated 200,000 people between 100 BC and 650 AD. These people practiced brutal sacrifices and believed the underworld could be reached through secret underground passages. The two main features of the city are pyramids. The first is the Pyramid of the Sun, which stands 213 feet tall and is the third biggest pyramid on Earth. The second is the Temple of the Moon, only measuring 147 feet tall. The positions of the temples and pyramids are not unlike the positions of the pyramids at Giza. They align with the sun and the summer solstice, showing a similar reverence for climate and fertility. The pyramids in Mexico and the pyramids in Egypt were both connected to the cosmos. What's truly unexplainable is that a rainstorm in 2003 revealed the entrance to a mysterious corridor running 60 feet beneath the main temple. Ever since, archaeologists have been busy excavating the site. One of the stranger things they found was an abundance of liquid mercury, one of the best superconductors in the world. They also found mica, which is used in modern electronics as a thermal insulator. Some accounts say the Pyramid of the Sun was once covered in mica, so it could have been used as a giant superconductor. It contains all the natural elements needed to be used as an electromagnetic power plant. It's a bit of a stretch, but not entirely impossible. Ancient alien enthusiasts say it could be that a far more superior race of beings taught the people of Teotihuacan how to turn their pyramid into an energy conductor. But what they use the energy for, and where the rest of the necessary components went, is anyone's guess. The Bermuda Triangle even with all our scientific advancements, the Bermuda Triangle is still an unsolved nightmare. It's one of the most mysterious spots on the planet, a place so strange sailors have been avoiding it for centuries. It's one of the few locations where a magnetic compass doesn't work, and many have attributed this issue to the mysterious losses of multiple ships and aircraft. There appears to be a magnetic vortex which disorients vehicles and tools, though nobody understands why. What you might not know is that the Bermuda Triangle isn't technically an official area. It's a vaguely defined triangle in the North Atlantic Ocean, home to the Milwaukee Depth, the deepest trench in the Atlantic. There are pockets here that reach a depth of 27,000 feet, pits that are so deep that most shipwrecks will never be seen again. There is also the abundance of methane. Many scientists have tried to solve the mystery of the triangle using the presence of methane. 
Large numbers of decaying marine animals trapped at the bottom of the sea release a high concentration of methane frost. This methane occasionally hits the surface in large bubbles, which could be responsible for sinking ships and crashing airplanes. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The Georgia Guidestones In 1980, a very strange monument suddenly appeared in Albert County, Georgia. The six huge rock slabs weighing over 230,000 pounds have since become known as the Georgia Guidestones. The monument stood 19 feet tall and quickly became famous as the American Stonehenge. But the mystery surrounding the Guidestones has never been solved. The thing is, nobody knows who commissioned them. This mystery has been around for 40 years, yet nobody has ever been able to crack it. The creator of the stones must have been extremely wealthy to build their own controversial monument without leaving behind a paper trail. The individual used only the pseudonym Robert C. Christian and claimed he was creating the tablets on behalf of loyal Americans. The controversy surrounding the tablets was immediate. Inscribed on these stones was a list of rules that humanity was recommended to follow. It suggested that the human population should never exceed 500 million and that humans should be united under a single language. It also said that personal rights should be balanced with social duties. It was deemed a satanic monument and was frequently vandalized by Christian extremists. On July 6, 2022, the Georgia Guidestones were bombed. Nobody knows who bombed them, but the remaining stones were dismantled before they were taken away, and the land where they once stood has been returned to its previous owner. And now for number two. But if you want more, be sure to stay tuned after number one for more things scientists can't explain in case you haven't seen it. Subaquatic Ship Graveyard and Noah's Ark Archaeologist Zdravka Georgieva and a team of specialists from the Center for Underwater Archaeology in Bulgaria recently mapped the floor of the Black Sea. They did this by using highly advanced sonar technology and remotely operated submersibles. During their investigation, they were shocked to accidentally discover a Greek trading ship sitting at the bottom of the sea. It was so deep that its timbers had hardly decayed due to the lack of oxygen, so the ancient boat was in surprisingly good condition. Researchers could even see the chisel marks on the wood left behind by the original builders. Some scientists are now saying the presence of this subaquatic ship could help solve the mystery of Noah's Ark. But amazingly, the Greek trading ship isn't the only wreckage down there. It was discovered off the coast of the ancient town of Nesabar, at a place where the bottom of the Black Sea is covered in shipwrecks dating back over 3,000 years. Some have suggested these shipwrecks are evidence of a biblical flood. The theory is that thousands of years ago, the Black Sea was a small freshwater lake. But when the biblical flood came, the Mediterranean overflowed and salt water poured into the Black Sea, causing it to flood a massive area. The ships are supposedly proof of this, evidence of a sudden event that wrecked hundreds of vessels. However, nobody has been able to confirm or deny this. Most scientists don't even believe in the flood, and those who do have very little evidence to support their claim. Zen Stones Zen stones can be found all over the world, but especially on Siberia's Lake Baikal. It's cold and dry at the lake in the winter, and the surface is frequently frozen. So finding Zen stones is common here. These stones hover over frozen lakes as if by magic, supported by nothing but a thin and nearly invisible layer of solid ice. For years, researchers were stumped as to the physics that allowed such a fascinating natural phenomenon to occur. However, the mystery may have finally been solved. A team from the University of Lyon in France used laboratory experiments to understand the physics of the Zen stones. They believe these stones are a result of sublimation. The Zen stones might look like magic, but there is a fairly reasonable explanation for their odd behavior. The ice around the stone slowly vanishes, but the stone protects the ice directly underneath it from the rays of the sun. This results in a thin layer of ice that supports the rock even as the rest of the ice vanishes, making it look like the rock is hovering above the frozen lake. The Flood One of the strangest historical coincidences that can be found all across the world is the myth of a great flood. In North America, most are familiar with the biblical flood story. 
God flooded the earth to get rid of the giant Nephilim, and Noah saved all the animals in his boat. But the truth is that there have been flood myths for over 4,000 years. And weirdly enough, they are all shockingly similar. The Babylonians had a flood story going back to the 17th century BC, in which a race of giants rebelled against the gods and had to be wiped off the face of the earth by a great flood. The creator of humans, the god Enki, warned a man named Utnapishtim of the incoming flood so that he could build an ark and save his family. This story was told an estimated 2,000 years before Noah's story became popular. But there's more. In Inca mythology, 500 years ago, they had their own flood myth. The creator god and supreme being, Kontiki, created a race of giants at the dawn of civilization. But the giants became too much to handle. They were irritating and didn't obey orders, and they were always causing trouble. So Kontiki turned the giants into stone and sent a mighty flood to wash them away. After the flood, he created humans, and they turned out to be much more agreeable with the rules. What we see is the same story rinsed and repeated throughout the eons. But the most shocking part is definitely the Inca making up the same story as the Babylonians. The two civilizations never had any contact. For some strange and mysterious reason, ancient civilizations across the globe believed giants ruled the earth and were annihilated by a flood. It makes you think there must have been at least some truth to the myth. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The King Tut Mystery A century after legendary British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, the ancient pharaoh is still a mystery. Questions still blight King Tut's life, his death, and his tomb. We know the boy king was born around 1305 BC. He ruled Egypt for just shy of 10 years before his death. When his tomb was found in 1922, it contained riches the likes of which no explorer had ever seen before. It was like wandering into Aladdin's Cave of Wonders and finding a magic carpet. Except instead of a magic carpet, archaeologists found Tutankhamun still at rest inside his marvelous sarcophagus. Researchers believe the reason his tomb remained sealed for so long had to do with his father, Pharaoh Akhenaten. He was such a hated pharaoh that after he died and his son left the throne prematurely, the rulers that came after tried to wipe their family lineage from history. This resulted in the tomb being lost, quite literally, underneath the sands of the Egyptian desert for over 3,300 years. A lot of advances have been made in understanding the young pharaoh's life, but we still don't know how he died. CT scans, X-ray scans, and DNA testing have shown that the king suffered from a lot of different issues. He had malaria at his time of death, he had a cleft palate, likely from years of inbreeding, and he had a broken leg. But scientists have never been able to determine exactly what killed him. I want to give a big shout out to Jorge Gonzalez Larramendi for all the super thanks. We really appreciate the support. If you are new here, welcome! And be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family for more mysterious discoveries. The Nazca Lines in 1926, one of the greatest discoveries in history was made 250 miles south of Lima in Peru. Near the shores of the Pacific Ocean, stretched across a great desert plain, there is a mystery thousands of years in the making. The Nazca Lines cover about 170 square miles of flat, empty earth. The soil here is broken up by incredibly complex pictures drawn by hand thousands of years ago. The geoglyphs include pictures of animals, complicated abstract patterns, images of strange beings that almost look like space aliens, and even fingerprints from giants. They don't appear to follow any kind of pattern. They are drawn with the same kind of randomness as a kid with a crayon and a blank sheet of paper. Modern people first saw the lines just shy of 100 years ago after airplanes were invented. The geoglyphs are truly enormous, some over 30 miles long. It's impossible to understand what they are from the ground. Even travelers who came across the lines in the 1500s thought they were just the remnants of roads. It wasn't until pilots started flying over the area that they realized the lines made up massive pictures. From above, it looks like a giant drew pictures of all their favorite animals in the sand with their fingertip. The people who made these geoglyphs were the Nazca culture. They lived throughout the region starting around 100 BC and flourished up until 800 AD. Their geoglyphs were carved into the dirt at random times during their reign. They also practiced mummification and cranial modification. 
We know who they were and how they made the geoglyphs, but the biggest enduring mystery is that nobody knows why. Do you have any theories? Let me know in the comments. The Mystery of the Keepers The mystery of the Elin Moore Lighthouse Keepers is a recent one, but still worth knowing about. The mystery began in January of 1900. Three lighthouse keepers named Thomas Marshall, James Duquette, and Donald MacArthur vanished on the island of Elin Moore off the coast of Scotland. The lighthouse keepers had gone to the island to maintain the lighthouse, but when the replacement crew arrived, all three men were gone. They were nowhere to be found, with the lighthouse itself in perfectly fine shape. There was no sign of a struggle, no sign of any violence, and no sign of the keepers. The only oddity was that two of their jackets were gone, suggesting they had gone outside and then never came back. But it also suggests one of the keepers went outside in a heavy storm without any rain gear on. At the end of the investigation, officials ruled it an accident. The official story was that the two men in rain jackets were wiped away by waves, and the third man was washed off the island when he tried to save them. However, there was never any proof that this happened, and there has been speculation ever since. Nobody knows what truly went down with the lighthouse keepers, but one of the most popular theories is that they were abducted by extraterrestrials. What do you think happened? Let me know in the comments, and be sure to hit subscribe while you're at it. The Han Pigment Han purple is a pigment used 2,000 years ago in China to eliminate the third dimension. That sounds a little strange, so let's break it down so that it makes more sense. Han purple was used to decorate pottery. It was used to color the terracotta warriors, and it was a favorite pigment for lots of ancient artists. But then, people suddenly stopped using it around the year 220 AD. The recipe for the pigment was lost until 1992, when Elizabeth Fitzhugh from the Smithsonian found it. She identified the chemical composition, which allowed scientists to recreate the pigment for the first time in 1700 years. The Han pigment was a very purple color of dye made from barium copper silicate. How in the world anyone figured out how to create this pigment so long ago is anybody's guess. Many researchers believe it may have been an accidental discovery during the process of glass making. To create this purple pigment, all the elements need to be melted together at temperatures upwards of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there's the whole thing about the third dimension. Scientists have found that when the purple pigment drops to extremely cold temperatures, its magnetic waves cease to exist in the third dimension. This happens if there's extremely high magnetism and the temperature has dropped near absolute zero. When these conditions are met, the pigment enters a state of matter rarely observed, essentially vanishing from our three-dimensional world. It's such a strange thing to comprehend that it would probably give Albert Einstein a headache. The Megaliths of Oceania The incredible megaliths of Oceania are a huge mystery. They are some of the most interesting monuments on the planet, and yet some of the least studied. The Moai sculptures of Easter Island are certainly intriguing, but there are so many more statues across Polynesia that nobody even knows about. There are the statues on Hiba Oa, the ancient fortress in New Zealand, the jungle pyramid on Rapa Iti, and the destroyed temple of Tapu Tapu Atea Maure on Leeward Islands. And let's not forget the Ha Amonga a Maui in Tonga, or the ruins scattered across the Hawaiian Islands. Most of these megalithic ruins were built hundreds or even thousands of years ago, and those who built them are long gone. In New Zealand during the 15th century, it was the Maori who built Mauna Kea Kea Fortress in Auckland. This was the largest structure they ever put together. For years after, the Maori told stories of how their ancestors all came from the same hill before the fortress was built, and how the spirits of their elders still resided in the place. Moving out from New Zealand, Polynesia is riddled with mysterious megaliths, strange stone complexes, and ruins so impressive they couldn't possibly have been built by mere mortals. Easter Island is only one piece of a much larger and stranger story. The Tel Dan Inscription The Tel Dan Inscription was the first physical evidence found of the biblical King David being a real person. The inscription was discovered on a broken chunk of stone known as a stela in 1993 in northern Israel. Archaeologist Abraham Biran was the man behind the discovery. The inscription on the stone commemorates the victory of an Aramean king over the king of the house of David. 
The text specifically mentions King David's Israelite horsemen being vanquished by the Aramean king with divine guidance from Hadad, an ancient god. The most important thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't technically mention any of the players by name. However, the dating of the inscription and its details have given scholars clues. It's generally agreed the stela is detailing the campaign of Hazael of Damascus, who defeated Jehoram of Israel and Aziah of Judah. What was so unprecedented about the discovery was its mention of the House of David, implying the historic reality of King David, one of the most important kings in the Bible. However, we still don't know if King David, in historical sense, was indeed the founder of the Israelite kingdom, like it says in the Bible, or simply the ruler of a tribal chiefdom. The Fuente Magna Near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, one of the most sacred bodies of water in the world, a bowl was found in 1958. It's not exactly a bowl like you might eat your cereal out of, but more of a large stone vessel. It's called the Fuente Magna, and it was decorated in engravings of strange anthropomorphic figures. Whoever decorated the vessel included images of zoological characters that almost looked like human-slash-animal hybrids. Even more mysterious than the anthropomorphic characters is the presence of two different types of script. The first one is a local language spoken by the Pukara people about 1,000 years ago. The second script appears to be an ancient version of Proto-Sumerian, spoken in Mesopotamia over 5,000 years ago. As you can imagine, the stone vessel presents a bit of a problem for historians. How in the world could a bowl have engravings from a language from Sumerian and a language from Bolivia separated by an entire ocean and 4,000 years at the same time? One of the theories is that a group of pilgrims from ancient Sumer somehow made it across the entire planet, hiked across the mountains and deserts of South America, and created a new society at Lake Titicaca. The issue is that we don't have any evidence other than the Fuente Magna. Expert Bernardo Biados says this is likely because the vessel was crafted by Sumerians who settled in Bolivia around 2500 BC. Then their culture gradually changed and they stopped carving things from their homeland, becoming a totally different civilization. What do you think? Did the Sumerians make it to Bolivia? Let me know in the comments! The Walls of Sacsayhuaman On the outskirts of the Peruvian city of Cusco is the megalithic complex of Sacsayhuaman. The city, occupied as early as 900 AD, is famous for its incredible stonework. The huge stone walls here were built with an unimaginable level of precision. Some of these stones making up the walls weigh over 200 tons, meaning they are some of the largest building blocks in ancient America. But all the stones have one thing in common. No matter how big or how small, they all fit together like puzzle pieces. These stone blocks fit so tightly together, you can't even put a piece of paper between many of them. Some of these stones even have rounded corners, as if they were cut with laser beams. For years, scientists have been stumped trying to figure out how the ancient people here created such strong walls. The interlocking stones are unlike anything found elsewhere in South America, or the rest of the ancient world for that matter. These weren't bricks stacked up uniformly, but giant boulders carved precisely to fit with other random giant boulders. Some say the builders used a special liquid that melted the rocks so that they fit together. This liquid would have been derived from natural plants found in Peru. Others, like retired architect John McCauley, say it was nothing special at all. John says it was a clever building technique utilized by engineers of the time. Still, that doesn't explain how the ancient inhabitants of this long-lost city managed to move boulders so heavy they would have needed the strength of a thousand men. Burial mounds in the Dutch countryside over the past few years, roughly 6,000 amateur archaeologists working with a heritage organization in the Netherlands have been scouring the hills and valleys for treasure. These amateur researchers have been hunting for archaeological anomalies and historical secrets. The efforts of the citizens to find out more about their homeland's ancient past has been a huge success. They have identified roughly 1,000 prehistoric burial mounds in the Dutch countryside. It seems the burials are everywhere across the rural landscape, painting a picture of a lost world. Seeing as we're dealing with 1,000 burial mounds, there are a lot of variables at play. Each mound is different in size and age. 
Some were used over 3,200 years ago in the Bronze Age, others as recently as 600 BC in the Iron Age. Researchers say the burials would have been accompanied by sacred rituals. The burial mounds are evidence of a rich society that dominated the Netherlands in prehistoric times. Researchers even found about 15 square miles of agricultural fields used by some of the earliest farmers in Europe. We don't have a name for these people yet. Researchers still have to excavate all 1,000 burials, but the mystery is real and there should be a lot more information coming out soon. Scientists have to uncover the details of a civilization they barely knew existed, so stay tuned! The Otomi In ancient North America, two main civilizations dominated the landscape just before the arrival of the Spanish. There were the Aztecs, who ruled the plains and hills of Mexico, and the Maya, who ruled the marshlands, jungles, and swampy coastlines. But there was also a third civilization, one that's been largely forgotten about and neglected by historians. They are called the Otomi, and they once inhabited a huge territory in central Mexico. They had a unique language and were different from the other cultures of Mexico. And apparently, they lived there for several thousand years before the Spanish ever arrived. Here's the most exciting part, though. The Otomi are still around. Many of the descendants of these people currently live in the Mexican states of Querétaro and Hidalgo. In 2015, an estimated 670,000 Otomi descendants were living in Mexico, making them the fifth largest ethnic group in the nation. Even though the Maya and the Aztec went extinct, their people didn't completely vanish, and neither did the Otomi. What has scientists really intrigued is that they don't know exactly where the Otomi came from. Oral histories say they were a peaceful people who expanded and diversified based strictly on farming and trade. They weren't warmongering people like their neighbors. They likely established themselves in central Mexico about 2,500 years ago. The Otomi may have even been the first people to occupy the valley. But then something bizarre happened. When the mysterious city of Teotihuacan was destroyed and abandoned in the 6th century, the Otomi were displaced. Those fleeing Teotihuacan eventually took over their lands and absorbed them into their own culture the red-haired cannibals. There may have been an ancient race of red-haired cannibals living in North America. According to the ancient legends of the Paiute Native Americans, the Cite Ka were a group of giants who lived in western Nevada. These horrible giants supposedly terrorized the Paiute people by killing and eating them. Almost every ancient civilization in the world had a story about giants. Giants can be found in the Bible, with a mighty Goliath that was said to be nine feet tall. The Greeks believed there was a land of giants, and even the Aztec thought that massive humans once roamed Mexico. It feels like something must have inspired all these civilizations to tell stories of humongous people, but it's the Paiute that have one of the most shocking histories with giants. After they were bullied by them for years, slowly picked off one by one and consumed, the Paiute fought back. They teamed up with other tribes to trick the giants into a dark and spooky cave. Then, when they had all the giants trapped inside, they lit a fire at the mouth of the cave and killed all of them from smoke inhalation. The very last of the Cite Ka, the fiery-haired giants, were burned. That's a way to get rid of them. It's Super Thanks shout-out time! I want to give a big thank you to Jennifer Cassia for your generous support. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. We'd love to have you! The Sachin The Sachin archaeological complex can be found 200 miles north of Lima, Peru, nestled along the Pacific coastline. This archaeological complex is a small piece of what remains of one of the largest and most impressive cultures that existed before the Inca. They were called the Sachin, or the Sachin Chasma and they ruled the area from 1800 to 900 BC. However, some experts believe they may have been around longer than that, starting their civilization some 4,000 years ago. These people were part of a powerful kingdom when ancient Egypt was just hitting its stride. The archaeological complex includes four major sites occupying a space of about four square miles. The most impressive by far is the pyramid, called Sechin Alto. It's a pyramid with a flat top that stands 115 feet tall and has a length of 984 feet. 
It's situated at the very center of the ancient complex, and much like how the Great Pyramid of Giza was once covered in pale white stone, so too was this pyramid dressed in granite blocks. Although now, the pyramid looks like an ordinary hill. If you were to walk by it, you wouldn't even realize it had ever been a structure. It's completely melted now and looks like a pile of dirt. However, don't let this pile of dirt fool you. Sechin Alto is believed to be the biggest pre-Columbian monument in all of Peru. When it was built about 3,600 years ago, it was the largest construction anywhere in the Americas. Even though it's a shell of what it once was, it's still a testament to the mysterious people who built it. The Lost Saganai According to the legends, the Kingdom of Saganai was a powerful realm ruled by pale blonde men who were wealthy in gold and gemstones. However, nobody knows if this kingdom ever existed for real, or if native Canadians used the story to trick the French. Whether they were real or not, tales of the Kingdom of Saganai and the untold wealth of the Canadian wilderness helped motivate France to claim Canada for itself. You may know a lot about the discoveries made by Christopher Columbus and Ferdinand Magellan, but fewer people know about Jacques Cartier's arrival in Newfoundland in 1534. He explored the maritime region of Canada, believing it was Asia. He even captured natives and took them back to France as prisoners to show the king. His second voyage was funded in 1535, and he went back with a lot more firepower. The French would eventually arrive in what is now Montreal. It was here where the natives told the French about the Kingdom of Saguenay. The kingdom was supposedly occupied by men with pale skin and blonde hair, and apparently there were a lot of them. They were also rich in gold, copper, and other valuable metals. But that winter, most of Cartier's crew died from scurvy, only a handful survived, and nobody ever met any residents of the Kingdom of Saguenay. The French looked for the place for years, but it was never discovered. These days, scholars believe the natives were trying to trick the gold-obsessed French into dying in the wilderness. Others believe the kingdom was real and was made up of Vikings who had already been in North America for hundreds of years. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Wadi the Wadi state was one of the first truly dominant empires in the Andean region of Peru. They controlled a vast portion of the Peruvian highlands, and they managed to do it by absorbing smaller and less capable cultures into their own kingdom. The Wadi, much like the Romans, then built a complex network of roads and highways to connect their individual settlements. They conquered and they innovated. In fact, when the Inca Empire emerged about 400 years later, they repurposed the roads built by the Wadi and used them to advance their own kingdom. It all started around 600 AD. From their capital of Wadi in the southern highlands, the Wadi went on the attack. It's not clear where exactly they came from or when their city was built in the first place, but the expansion began around 1,400 years ago. The Wadi armies poured through the valleys and into the coastlands, where they dominated everyone in their path. They took captives and used brutal force, but expanded peacefully where possible. What's really interesting is that they brought with them advanced scientific knowledge. Those who they could beat without a fight were swayed by things like irrigation and more sophisticated agricultural techniques. However, the Wadi state came to a halt around the year 1000. Much like how the Roman Empire grew far too big for its own good, so too did the Wadi Empire. All those roads allowed for easier fighting between various cities and tribes. Internal chaos worsened by a series of droughts cracked open the Wadi civilization. Soon enough, they collapsed under their own weight. The Mystery Outside Bethlehem A tour guide found an ancient 2,800-year-old pillar under an orchard in Palestine. The mysterious pillar, discovered near Bethlehem, appears to have been built around the 9th century BC. That was during the days when the first temple still stood in Jerusalem. However, the first temple was later destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon around 586 BC. The remains of this structure are in one of the most politically sensitive areas in the world, the West Bank. And for this reason, excavations have proved pretty much impossible. 
However, prominent Israeli archaeologist Yosef Garfinkel did visit the site and confirmed the remains to be monumental. He also confirmed the dating and said the pillar likely marks the entrance to an ancient water tunnel moving deep underground. When this thing was made, it would have been a huge construction. It would have been a grand water project, something established by the Judean kings who ruled from nearby Jerusalem. It may have even been King Hezekiah from the Bible who helped fund the building project, the Essenes. The Essenes weren't necessarily a civilization of their own. Instead, they were an extremely mysterious sect of Judaism that appeared around the 2nd century BC. The Essenes established themselves at the city of Qumran and were strictly dedicated to Jewish scripture. Many scholars believe they were responsible for writing the Dead Sea Scrolls. Even by other Jewish sects of the day, they were considered strange and extreme. They had a firm belief that there was only good and evil in the world and that all history was predestined. They even believed that the apocalypse would happen soon. Because the Essenes were obsessed with writing things down, we have a very good idea of what views they held. We haven't had to do a lot of interpretation based on archaeological evidence because they really wrote down everything they thought. For the Essenes, the world was a bad place. They believed that they lived in an era of violence and evil. They also believed that a future age of perfection was coming when God would finally correct humanity and abolish the unbelievers. They were also some of the earliest religious people who theorized that there was a great agent of evil causing problems for humanity. This figure would come to be known as the devil. But what happened to these apocalyptic mystics? In the end, they were annihilated in a war against Rome. It's believed the very last of them were killed at Masada, or at the Massacre of Qumran in 68 AD. The Kerma Culture of Nubia In the lands of Nubia, to the south of Egypt, there were many powerful states that came and went. One of the most noteworthy was the Kerma Culture. They became the most powerful Nubian state starting around 2500 BC. A partially fortified settlement with only around 2,000 people living in it founded their own distinctive culture, which spread out 200 miles in all directions. The kings of Kerba truly solidified their place in history when they captured northern Nubia from the Egyptians. However, the land grab didn't last very long. The Kerma culture reached their peak around 1650 BC when they overtook northern Nubia. But then they were humiliated when they were defeated in 1500 BC by the Egyptians, who took back all the land that was stolen from them. And as a result, the Kerma culture was destroyed. Like so many that had fallen before, the Kerma were helpless as they were absorbed into the new kingdom of Egypt. Still, there were those who fought back. For hundreds of years to come, rebels who still remembered the glory of Kerma fought against the Egyptian rulers. And then, around the 11th century BC, after 400 years of fighting, the Kingdom of Kush emerged. Researchers aren't entirely sure, but many believe it was the Kerma rebels responsible for the creation of the Kushite Empire. The Guanches The Guanches are the mysterious native inhabitants of the Canary Islands. When the Spanish invaded and conquered the islands in the 15th century, the Guanches had already been living there for quite some time. In fact, many initially believed the Guanches were the descendants of Atlanteans. And this is still a prominent theory in the community today, because unlike other island people, the Guanches were tall, upwards of six feet. They also had blue eyes and blonde hair, just like the rumored descendants of Atlantis. They didn't look anything like the other islanders that the Spanish had come across. During Jean de Betancourt's expedition to the Canary Islands in 1402, he described the Guanches as being the most beautiful race of people in the world. He also noted that the Guanches would have been scientific geniuses if anyone had bothered to educate them. Instead, the Guanches lived a simple life of survival. They caught fish for food and had no idea how to work metal, and apparently they hadn't progressed much beyond the Stone Age. Many wonder if this was on purpose, if the Guanches simply enjoyed living a primitive existence. Whatever the case may be, the Guanches were and are truly exceptional. They were also extremely advanced socially when the Spanish found them. 
They had progressed far beyond many European nations when it came to equal rights. The Europeans were shocked to see that divorce was common and that many women had two or three husbands. I don't know how they had time for that, but you know. The Bakoni Ruins In South Africa's Mpumalanga province, there is a group of ruins that have intrigued scientists for decades. The ruins are in an area of hills known to the locals as the Place of Happiness. It's located in a remote and tranquil location, holding the remnants of a lost civilization. The ruins were likely made by the enigmatic Bakoni people who lived here in the 16th century. But nobody knows if that's true or not. Many believe the Bakoni built the ruins thousands of years earlier. In fact, the Bakoni ruins are said by some to be at the center of the beginning of human civilization. Professor Peter Delius from the University of Witwatersrand says the Bakoni ruins represent an extremely advanced group of locals. It's clear the Bakoni were using progressive agricultural techniques and were on the cutting edge of innovation. We can see the exact way the Bakoni affected the landscape. They were doing crop rotations and managing livestock and even boosted agricultural yields in the grasslands. They built stone-walled mazes in their spare time and also worked on terrace fields, road networks, and small homesteads. This is one interpretation of the mysterious ruins. If true, it means the ruins are likely no more than a few centuries old. However, there are still those who say these structures were built 250,000 years ago by Paleolithic humans. This theory suggests the ruins were part of the earliest human civilization that ever existed, a group of builders who lived in South Africa when Homo sapiens first evolved. But unfortunately, as exciting as that theory sounds, there is no scientific evidence to confirm it. Lost Egyptian Temple A team of archaeologists in Egypt recently made an incredible discovery. They uncovered a mysterious temple from 4,500 years ago. The temple dates back to the 5th dynasty and was found joined to a cemetery where pharaohs were once buried. Researchers say that in the 5th dynasty, which stretched between 2465 and 2323 BC, there were six main sun temples built in dedication to Ra, Egyptian god of the sun, lord of the sky, and king of kings. Up until recently, only two of these sun temples have been found. But now, thanks to a team of Polish and Italian archaeologists, it looks like we have a third. The temple is currently a huge mystery. Mustafa Waziri from Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities described the structure as made from mud bricks and limestone. Clay seals were found inside bearing royal names, like King Shepses Kare, who ruled Egypt in 2494 BC. They even found pots for beer, which was used during rituals and ceremonies. Ordinary people didn't just walk around drunk in ancient Egypt. Beer was typically reserved for ceremonies. The intoxicating effect of the beer would be attributed to the power of the gods. Because people only got drunk during ceremonies, they may have believed the effect was a direct result of honoring their deities. Civita di Bagno Reggio Very few places in Europe look the same today as they did in the Middle Ages. But there is one place that looks almost identical, and it's nothing short of breathtaking. Civita di Bagno Reggio is a medieval city that has remained untouched by the modern world. While Italians used to call it the dying town because of its slow decay, modern times have revitalized it and turned it into a major tourist attraction. Towns that before were dying are now cherished for their history, and so you can't even enter this city without paying a fee. What makes the medieval city so impressive is that it sits on the top of a mountain. The tower in the center of this city has impressive views of the surrounding Italian countryside in all directions, even overlooking the mountains in the distance. The city almost looks like it grew out from the top of the mountain, like it's been there since the dawn of time. In reality, the city was founded about 2,500 years ago. It was the Etruscans who first climbed the mountain's peak and thought the plateau looked like an excellent place for a settlement. In later years, the city fell under Roman rule, and after the 5th century and the fall of Rome, it was taken over by the Lombards. 
1695, Tivita de Baño Regio was decimated by an earthquake, and in the centuries that followed, it was virtually abandoned. Only recently did tourism save the city from crumbling to dust. It's shout-out time! I want to say a big thank you to Space Ranger Rick 13 and Leroy Majorman for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about mysterious ancient places. And let me know where you'd like to visit in the comments. The Cursed Fort India's Merangar Fort is supposedly cursed. The ancient fortress is a testament to the architectural prowess of India in the Middle Ages. It was constructed 300 feet above the countryside in 1459. Even over 500 years later, the fort still stands proudly on the plateau, dominating the view from anywhere in the surrounding cities. Within the fortress itself are multiple palaces, some newer and some older. It has expansive courtyards, there is a public museum, and only a single road that winds from the mouth of the fortress down to the city below and the peasants who reside there. The fortress walls even have dents from where cannonballs hit them during battle. But you might be curious about the curse. According to legend, King Rao Joda was the man who built the majestic fort by carving it out of the hill itself. But to do this, he had to first remove the people who were already living there. Everyone left the hill except a single old man who wanted to die in his own home. He was something of a saint, a known holy man who spent his days feeding birds. When the king forced him to leave his own property, the saint cursed the monarch that his kingdom would be plagued with miseries. The king was shocked to be cursed and tried desperately to get the old man to change his mind. The old man said the only way to remove the curse was if somebody sacrificed themselves and was buried in the foundations. A noble named Rajaram Megwal was the one who sacrificed his life, being buried alive so that the fortress could be built. Legend has it the noble is still buried somewhere beneath the Meirungar fort. Do you believe in curses? Let me know in the comments! Etowa Indian Mounds From between 1000 and 1550 AD, the Mississippian culture ruled a huge part of the southeastern United States. They were responsible for the construction of the biggest cities north of Mexico prior to European intervention. In Georgia, not far from Cartersville, you can find the remains of one of their most mysterious cities. The site itself is called Etowa Indian Mounds, and it stretches 54 acres. Scientists believe it was occupied for at least 550 years by an advanced group of Mississippians. According to Georgia State Parks, the people who built the nameless city were likely the ancestors of the Muscogee Creek culture. The Muscogee Creek and the Cherokee still consider the Etowa Mounds to be sacred. There are three main platform mounds inside the park, and three slightly smaller mounds, but there were hundreds of buildings. In 2005, scientists began mapping the ground using magnetometers. They found a total of 140 buildings that once stood on the site, and that's only scratching the surface. Archaeologists also found fragments of pottery from an even older civilization who lived here, around 200 BC. This was clearly a very important place. And yet, despite the research, experts still can't say why. Scientists can't even say what the mounds were used for, other than they had some ceremonial value. Shamans may have conducted ceremonies atop the mounds, or they may have just been elevated platforms for houses. The other mystery researchers can't solve is where the people here went. Nobody knows why they suddenly abandoned their great city, although it may have had something to do with warfare. Archaeologists did find a semicircular fortification system surrounding the mounds. This means they definitely had a way to defend themselves. They also found the remains of an orchard surrounding the fortification, which would have prevented archers from shooting flaming arrows over the top. Queen of Sheba's Embankment The Ijebu Kingdom emerged fairly recently in western Nigeria about 500 years ago. They suddenly appeared in southern Yoruba land and constructed their capital of Ijebu Ode around the 15th century. The members of the kingdom were ethnic Yoruba, 
a group of people who still live throughout Nigeria, Togo, and Benin. Surrounding the borders of the Ijebu Kingdom is a series of forgotten ditches and embankments. These ditches and embankments can be found in the forests, mostly overgrown and disused for centuries. The most impressive is called the Queen of Sheba's Embankment. It's longer than Hadrian's Wall in England, over 100 miles, and circles an area bigger than Greater London. It's one of the most impressive ancient constructions that most people haven't even heard of. In fact, this embankment is believed to be the largest man-made monument in Africa, although this hasn't been officially proven. The embankments and ditches surrounding the Lost Kingdom's borders are a mystery. They were likely used as some kind of great defensive mechanism, but nobody really knows. The Queen of Sheba's embankment has never even been officially dated, although it definitely was made before the Ijebu Kingdom. Archaeologists have suggested it was built around 870 AD, though this has been confusing because human activity has been found here dating back to the Stone Age. And then there's the legend of the queen herself. There is a sacred grove sheltered inside the overgrown embankment. It's said that the legendary Queen of Sheba, the very same from the Bible, is buried somewhere within. The Meta Romuli There was once a pyramid in Vatican City. It was called the Meta Romuli or the Piramide Vaticana, and it dated back somewhere around 1,500 years. In the early days of Rome, we're talking the 1st century BC, there was an obsession with ancient Egyptian culture. Even Caesar Augustus liked the Egyptian customs enough to copy their pyramids in his own constructions. Rome teetered on having their emperors buried in pyramids like the Egyptian pharaohs of old, but settled for building pyramid-shaped monuments instead. One of these monuments was the Meta Romuli. It's a huge stone pyramid built between the Vatican's St. Peter's Basilica and the Mausoleum of Hadrian. It's important to note that the pyramid no longer stands. By the 16th century, it was almost completely demolished, and nobody even knew what it was. There were rumors in the Middle Ages that the pyramid was used as a tomb for the legendary founders of Rome, brothers Romulus and Remus. Its remains weren't found in modern times until construction work in 1948. The concrete foundation was found, but the pyramid was long gone. Even today, experts don't know what the pyramid was used for, or even who commissioned its construction. The Isle of Tortuga one of the greatest pirate strongholds in history was a place called Tortuga. This ancient and mysterious island is in the Caribbean and was used in the 17th century as a pirate town. Just like Port Royal in Jamaica, Tortuga was a base of operations to attack Spanish colonies. French and English colonists arrived on the island in 1625. Prior to them, the island was home to a small group of Spanish colonists who had been there for nearly a century. The French and the English began to establish plantations, then found themselves being bullied by the Spanish. They tried to kick out the colonists in 1629, but found themselves defeated. Starting in 1630, French and English colonies divided Tortuga in half. By the 1640s, they were building stone fortifications to defend against any kind of Spanish incursion. Somewhere along the way, pirates began to use the island as a safe haven. Buccaneers like Henry Morgan and Francois Lolonnais frequented Tortuga. But as with all other pirate strongholds, modernism and globalization were inevitable. The French and Spanish signed a treaty, and piracy was a thing of the past. The buccaneers were expelled from Tortuga and Spain handed the island over to France in 1697. These days, the island belongs to the Haitians. But here's something you might not know. Tortuga and the rest of Haiti was inhabited 7,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found evidence of farming villages established by the indigenous Arawak starting around 300 BC in Haiti. Nobody knows exactly where these people came from, only that they lived in the Caribbean for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. When Christopher Columbus found Hispaniola in 1492, it was populated by a group called the Taino, but over the next few decades, the Spanish enslaved and killed them all. By the time the age of piracy started, 
Most of the indigenous people had been killed working in the mines as slaves. Their culture and history is buried alongside long-forgotten stashes of pirate treasure on these Caribbean islands. Rujum El Hiri Rujum El Hiri looks like a primitive maze built in the middle of a farmer's field. It's the largest megalithic monument anywhere in the Near East, located just a few miles from the Sea of Galilee. It's in the historic area of Golan Heights, located almost 3,000 feet above sea level. Although the ancient monument looks like a maze, archaeologists think it was an astronomical observatory. It's the Israeli version of Stonehenge, just without the stones. Instead of being built using megalithic blocks like the ancient Druids in Britain, Rujum El Hiri was made using 40,000 tons of basalt rock. The rock was spread in an arrangement of concentric circles at a height of about 8 feet. Little more than a foot of rock remains today. The one thing scientists can't really figure out is how exactly the monument was used by ancient astronomers. It was built 5,500 years ago, long before people understood anything about the distant cosmos. Experts think the stone circles may have lined up with the sun, allowing the ancients to track each solstice. In the 1990s, archaeologist Jonathan Mizrachi noticed the entranceway pointed directly at the sunrise on the summer solstice. There also appear to be notches in the walls that indicate the equinoxes. There also may have been villages here, suggesting a prehistoric cult of star worshippers. Dolbadarn Castle Dolbadarn Castle isn't in the best shape. It's a crumbling fortification built early in the 13th century. After all these years, the only thing that still stands is a single circular keep and the stubby remains of some walls. It still technically has a courtyard, but the towers and fortifications that once surrounded it are long gone. Still, the keep, which rises a whopping 46 feet, gives unparalleled views of the Welsh countryside. The tower is in such a picturesque spot that it's been used in famous paintings for centuries and is one of Wales's top scenic destinations. The history behind the castle is equally fascinating. It was built by Llewellyn the Great, King of Gwynedd. He ruled Wales for 45 long years, using Dolbadarn Castle as a strategic military outpost. In 1284, Edward I, King of England, took the castle away and then stole pieces of it to build another castle at Caernarfon, which, by the way, is another extremely impressive castle in Wales. After this, Dolbadarn was a sad shell of its former self. It was used briefly as a manor house, and then nobody really knows what happened to it. Between the 14th and 18th centuries, there are very few records of the castle. But then, in the 1760s, the castle, in ruins at this point, became a favorite topic for painters and enjoyed some serious publicity. The Fishbourne Roman Palace In 1805, construction workers in England accidentally found the remains of one of the most impressive Roman palaces in Britain. A new home was being built and the construction workers were shocked when they came across the ruined foundations of a very real palace. It's now called the Fishborn Roman Palace because it was found in the village of Fishborn. It was built around 75 AD, which was 30 years after the Roman Empire conquered Britain. This villa, or palace, whichever you prefer, was home to one of the first elite Roman British families. Just like modern people, Romans were constantly upgrading their homes. The palace was built in the 1st century and received extensions and alterations for the next 200 years. Mosaics were overlaid with more sophisticated works of art. New owners destroyed old mosaics and replaced them with their favorite pieces. More wings were added, better construction materials were used, then the whole place burnt to a cinder in 270 AD and was abandoned. Archaeologists don't know what happened only that the villa burned to the ground and nobody ever built on the land again. Thanks for watching. What was your favorite place? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.